Welcome back, Canonites. This time we're taking a hard look at Sung Helios. We start on board Infinity. Locke briefly talks with Commander Palmer, who is escorting Halsey to Sung Helios, where she'll have a plan ready to share. Afterwards, as they walk towards their ride to the Sung Heli homeworld, Vale brings up Locke's work with Oni, specifically his recommendation for assassinating the Arbiter. She asks why it never happened, to which he responds, Things changed. Now, I don't know about you, but this exchange kind of bothered me. I get why they did it from a narrative standpoint, but what's with the last question? Why didn't he do it? Did Vale miss the end of the Human Covenant War three months after Locke filed his report? I know this is nitpicking at its worst, but it did bother me. Side note, how cool would it have been if this Sangheili had been Untho or Uze, or perhaps even better, Maki Chava, since we spend so much time talking to her later on? Missed opportunities, 343. Anyway, as Osiris prepares to leave, Lasky quickly reminds Locke that this is a black op before wishing them luck. From there, Osiris deploys to Sung Helios, backed up by the aforementioned Maki Chava. Interestingly, the deployment date is October 27th, the same day that the Master Chief is officially declared dead. It's also the same day that Agent Maya Sankar, aka Pharaoh, arrived at Conrad's Point to investigate a Guardian Awakening site currently under the control of the new Colonial Alliance. Once deployed, we get some of the clunkiest pieces of exposition since Keys explaining the Halo Ring in Halo CE. At least in the case of Keys, neither the player nor the Chief knew what Halo was. You cannot, repeat, cannot tell me that Locke, and probably Osiris in general, wouldn't be familiar with the Arbiter's Swords of Sangelios. We know for a fact that Vale, at the very least, knows about them, since she worked with the Swords during Operation Farstorm. Anyway, the Spartans are informed that the Arbiter is currently at a place called the Elder Council Chamber, and they begin doing what Spartans do best, kill Covenant. As I mentioned back in both Episodes 1 and 2, the Sanghelios levels really allow Vale to shine as a character. From her notes on Sanghili culture to a death prayer for fallen swords, Vale truly shines as an exposition tool to explain what's going on. Best of all, it works from a narrative perspective since the rest of Osiris isn't going to know all these things and Vale, having a lifelong fascination with Sanghili culture, would want to share her passion. The first level in this Sanghilio sequence isn't much to write home about, narratively speaking, but it does feature some nice combat sequences, notably the Mantis run that starts roughly about halfway through the level, leading right up to the encounter with the Arbiter, if one so chooses. And god, when we'd finally do encounter the Arbiter, 343 chose a damn brilliant way to introduce him. As you come up to the council chamber, you see the Arbiter slay two would-be assassins, before wondering what the hell Spartans are doing there. After saving the Arbiter, Locke meets with him to discuss their plan of using the Guardian at Sunion. The Arbiter is not too pleased with the presence of the man that once volunteered to kill him, never mind Locke's former association with Oni. As the Arbiter brings up Locke's hunt for the Master Chief, Cortana suddenly appears, seemingly undaunted by Locke's hunt. Cortana's presence also indicates that she knows about the Sunion Guardian, making the need to execute their plans much more urgent. The Arbiter, while willing to help, makes it clear that he will not do so unless victory is assured. So, time to pause and bring up another point of contention with Halo 5, or rather, Halo 2 Anniversary, depending on how you view it. I'm sure almost everyone is familiar with the bonus cutscenes included with the Master Chief Collection, the ones said to leave us at the doorstep to Halo 5. However, after playing the campaign, it doesn't take a genius to realize that these cutscenes have no place in the game. The way things play out is literally impossible, unless the characters all had a sun case of amnesia. At best, if you cut out the initial conversation and start with Locke asking about the demon moniker attributed to the Master Chief, you could argue a loose canonicity. The second bonus cutscene is easier to explain since it loosely mirrors the opening to the Battle of Sunion, but the canonicity is still dubious at best. Personally, it never bothered me all that much, but I understand full well why it bothers others. That said, I'm not exactly sure how you could set up Halo 5 in an effective manner without changing some details around. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Moving forward, Osiris meets up with Dr. Halsey to discuss her plan. Using a constructor, Halsey will be able to feed the coordinates into the Sinion Guardian, a simple plan that really only requires Osiris to secure a constructor, which, thankfully, Sunk Helios, and specifically the local area, has an excess. From there, Osiris meets up with Palmer, who then deploys them to a location near a Forerunner site. While Osiris fights Covenant along the ground, the Arbiter's forces take to the air to distract a Covenant Kraken. After fighting a few more waves of Covenant, Osiris finds their path blocked by the Kraken and takes to the air to fight it. Now, the way that Osiris takes to the air is fairly strange, at least in my opinion. Let's really examine this. 
as Osiris comes around a path leading to the canyon holding the Forerunner facility, two soldiers appear but quickly retreat. As we follow, they head for a pad waiting with Phaetons. Once those two take off, four more Phaetons appear for Osiris. Stranger still, if you follow the Phaetons taken by the soldiers, they're suddenly marked as friendlies once in the air. So, that begs the question, what the hell is going on? I can't imagine Cortana is in any way directing these soldiers. Why would she want to help Osiris with anything, especially since their end goal is reaching Blue Team on Genesis? Are these soldiers perhaps part of some independent local defense for the Forerunner site? Soldiers are a type of Forerunner Armager, and we know that some Armagers had been left to defend Forerunner sites after the Forerunners left the Milky Way. This whole thing is a really strange moment that I really didn't think about initially, but has since come to bother me quite a bit. Unfortunately, there's no definitive answer out there, and it could very easily just be some kind of scripting error, who knows. Anyway, once the Kraken is taken down, Osiris heads into the Forerunner site and recovers a Constructor. Once back at the Arbiter's camp, they quickly debrief with Palmer before talking with Halsey. The Doctor informs Osiris that she's uploading the slipspace coordinates into the Constructor. It isn't long before the Constructor is ready, heading straight to Sunayan to awaken the Guardian. The Arbiter then gathers his forces and readies for deployment. As they leave, though, Halsey gives Locke one final warning about Cortana. You know what I did to create the Spartans, all in the name of the greater good. Doctor, we don't have time. Cortana is built from a matrix of my own mind. The Domain gives her incredible power. I Cortana's motivations spelled out in plain English. Although, I honestly believe this is a bit misleading. We'll talk about why when we actually get to the breaking, because that's where it really becomes relevant. The next scene opens with the Swords of Sanghelios and Fireteam Osiris heading towards Sunion. Along the way, Buck asks Tanaka to say a few words. Now this scene does a nice job of showing just how Osiris has started to come together, and highlights Tanaka's personal growth. If you bought the limited or collector's edition of Halo 5, you may have read the character cards that were included. In these, Tanaka is described as quiet, self-reliant, and unfazable. In short, she's a shut-in. In the Meridian levels, many of her statements are very matter-of-fact and blunt, save for a few moments here and there. But now, having spent time with Osiris, seeing them accept her unlike a <clears throat> certain group of ODSTs, she's opened up, grown, as a character. It's not huge, and you can easily miss it, but it's a moment that shines when you do recognize it. So, after Tanaka's speech, the Battle of Sunayan begins. In what is probably the best depiction of large-scale battle in the Halo franchise, the Swords of Sanghelios and Osiris fly into Sinaion, a pre-covenant holy city, resting place of the Guardian, and the final stronghold of Julum Dama's Covenant. Once in the city, Osiris proceeds to take out anti-air guns, while the Arbiter's forces embark on their own mission. After taking out several guns, Osiris seemingly hits a dead end, but finds an elevator into the Undercity near the Guardian's resting place. Fun fact, remember this piece of intel from the opening level? Obtain scans of new Forerunner glyphs. One is completely new. Running the other through the system revealed it contains a similar design to an ancient Sanghili symbol. This... Well, here's that symbol. It's in the last anti-air gun section. Easy to miss if you aren't looking. I know I missed it, I don't know how many times. Fighting through more waves of Covenant, it isn't long before Osiris finds the Arbiter again, this time engaging Promethean forces. Like before, the Prometheans are no match for Osiris, especially when backed up by the Swords of Sanghelios. Eventually, the Warden Eternal appears again, but he too falls just as before. With the Promethean forces eliminated, the only problem now is getting to the Guardian, which hangs in the air over Sunion. Luckily, Palmer appears with a pelican to personally escort Osiris. Struggling to fly through the plasma-filled air and even taking a hit, Palmer nevertheless manages to get Osiris to the Guardian, but, as one can see, is headed for quite the rough landing. Locke pauses briefly, worrying about the fate of Palmer, but is snapped out of his shock by Vale. With Osiris inside the Guardian, it opens a slipspace portal and leaves for Genesis. And thus concludes the Sanghelios levels. I have to say, when I first played these levels, I thought they would be universally loved by the community. Well, as universally loved as anything in our community can be. But anyway, to my surprise, these levels have been somewhat divisive. I'd say there's still more love than anything else, but I was surprised to find that people actually hated them, or at the very least while enjoying them, weren't a fan of how they seemed to bring a halt to the plot for five levels. While I can't agree with that entirely, I can't necessarily blame those people. Technically speaking, the plot does detour for a bit on Sanghelios, but for me it was enjoyable enough that I didn't really mind. Seeing the Arbiter in action was an absolute blast, and while I wish he and his forces could have had their own unique models and armor, it was still enjoyable. 
Speaking of enjoyment, these levels, along with some absolutely spectacular intel items, are filled with fantastic easter eggs, especially during the stop and look levels. Some of my favorite easter eggs include the Sangheili medical tent, and Dama Keep. Their plasma blades burn less intensely, harder to cut armor, but the injuries are more grievous and do not cauterize. So the blades leave Sangheili alive, but too wounded to fight most choose. The Sangheili and Ungoy pals, there's this one thing I've been thinking about for years. Say you're a nice thing, right? And there was a mean thing that turned nice things into mean things, but you caught it. Would you kill the mean thing once and forever, or would you maybe take the mean thing and put it someplace safe so people in the future could find it and feed it to some dogs? I'm just saying that I might probably not do the second one. Huh. Runty science. If my hypothesis be correct, soon the Dr. Halsey will release her spores and spin a cocoon of rich meat silk. Mm. Truly, this is a very exciting time to be making science! <laughs> and of course, the love poem. I love your brightly shining armor, human named Commander Palmer. There's also a nice scene with two Sangheili talking about Sully Neon. Too bad he was an utter waste, like much of Escalation. Speaking strictly on the Intel side, there is, as always, a ton of fantastic bits of audio to listen to. Some, notably the Ancient Swords, further flesh out Sangheili culture. Some of what we hear is familiar to lore fans, but there are some new ones, such as... When night falls, even the greatest Kolo herder will still smell like a Kolo. You see, Kilo 5, this is what I'm expecting when you promise to flesh out some Healy culture, not that let would humans say shit. No, I'm still not over that. Another great series of intel items follows two Sangheili brothers, one with the Covenant, the other with the Swords of Sanghelios. Each tries to convince the other to follow their cause, and ultimately, they end up killing each other in combat. Finding these throughout the campaign is really emotional and really helps ground the conflict between the Sangheili. Other intel includes the start of Kit Pitlimp's adventures, Some words on Sangheili medical practices. Now this one's interesting as it shows a shift in Sangheili culture, which traditionally sees spilling blood outside of battle as dishonorable. An anthropological report from a Sangheili studying ancient ruins. Interestingly, there's a mention of a great drowning, which to me screamed flood. I may be projecting my own hopes here, but a man can dream, right? There are several intel items reflecting how the Arbiter is seen by other Sangheili, such as an Indama loyalist who feels shame at the notion of killing his target after getting to know him, or Sangheili Honor Guard who constantly worries over how he appears in the Arbiter's eyes. My favorite is a praise from a Sangheili who reveals that the Arbiter likes to steal some of Lord Hood's more memorable lines. Let us never forget those who have journeyed into the Howling Dark and did not return, he once said. Have you ever heard such wisdom? And there's even more still. There is a wealth of amazing items to listen to throughout the Sangheilios levels. Unfortunately, I must, again, bring up a very important fact. Few of these, if any, actually contribute to Halo 5's story. The universe at large? Absolutely. Halo 5? Not so much. I think what really holds it back is the fact that 343 seems to want to tie the delivery of this intel into the mission and setting, make it relevant to what's going on. That's nice, and definitely helps immerse the player, but when your game is pulling from all these stories and events from the expanded universe, it's necessary, absolutely necessary, to explain that to the player. At the very least, give them a chance to discover that information. Going forward, whether they decide to return to terminals or stick entirely with intel, I'd obviously hope for a mixture of both, 343, when deciding what goes into this stuff, needs to look at the important story elements players not familiar with the expanded universe absolutely need to know. If nothing else, an in-game encyclopedia of some kind, perhaps something along the lines of Mass Effect's Codex, is needed. I know the Halo channel exists, but in its current form, it's extremely difficult to navigate and is missing a lot of vital information, even for Halo 5, never mind that there's no incentive for the average player to check out the universe articles. But that does it for Sanghelios. Next time, we'll be looking at the last three levels, Genesis, The Breaking, and Guardians. After that, a wrap-up covering things I may have missed, ideas I feel could improve Halo 6 or whatever comes next, and a real valuation of my rating for Halo 5. This has been Halo Cannon, and I want to thank you all for your patience during this journey. Till next time. Hey guys, thanks for watching. 
If you liked this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up, subscribing, and sharing it around. You are the reason I get to keep doing this, so thank you, profusely thank you. If you want to dive deeper into Halo's lore, head over to the Halo Archive. It's a lore-based community that welcomes everyone from experts to rookies. No matter what your working knowledge, you'll be sure to find a friend and a good time.